Today is the 18th of November 2013. My name is Sherry Wong and this interview is for the Ming Ai London Institute, British Chinese Workforce Heritage Project. Can I begin by asking your name? My name is Ji Dong Wu. And could you spell that for me, please? And in English, J I D O N G. Ji Dong, and last name Wu, W U. And where were you born? I was in China, Nanjing. Yeah. And could you tell me a bit about your family? Uh, well, um, my family, well, my parents actually, my mother was a peasant or farmer. My father was a teacher, school teacher at that time. So I have brothers and sisters. Okay. And what education did you have? Well, in China, I got, uh, <clears throat> apart from the primary, middle school education, and then I went to medical school in 1976. And then after that, I worked for a few years in a clinic in Jiangsu province. Then I went to do my second degree, which is master degree in Shanghai University of Traditional Chinese Medicine. And after graduation, I worked at the Nanjing University of Traditional Chinese Medicine there until 1993. And when did you come to the UK? I came to UK on the 10, 28th of May 1993, which is the date I always remember. It's just about over 20 years from now. And how were you able to come over to the UK? Well, that was an interesting question, actually. I was sent by the Chinese local government as a scholar exchange. So they just funded my trip for one year. And uh, I still can remember, actually, I only got something like 3,800 3, pounds for uh, the funding. And then I stayed in the UK but at that time, I found actually there are more I can do as a TCM practitioner and also my knowledge in traditional Chinese medicine because I can speak a little bit English and also understanding more in Chinese medicine. So therefore, I try to settle down here and just doing the things like teaching and the practice in the UK since then. And then, um, what jobs did you have before working in TCM? Well, in are you are you talking about in the UK or in in China? Um, both. Well, in China, after middle school, the graduation from the middle school, I was worked in uh, like uh, in the 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 farm or we called fire br- uh, the the brigade production brigade for two years and then I did the uh, accountant job without any trainings for one year. So that was one year actually that was my experience in China and then I went to the, the medical schools in 1996. Yeah. And then I practiced Chinese medicine in China and then further education degree course and then teaching in the university. So it's mainly just the teaching and the practice. From 1993, after I immigrated to the UK, I also doing the same thing, you know, teaching and the practice. And um, what motivated you to work in TCM? Well, it's not a motivation actually as such as possibly you may know. In China, you don't have, at that time, you don't have much choice, actually. It's more like you were appointed or you were allocated to study in this subject or that subject. I still can remember in 1996, yeah, and uh, that was just after the Cultural Revolution, but not back to that uh, national examination for entering universities as such. So I was trying to apply, I was qualified to apply for get to the university. 
And because my father was a teacher, so I said, okay, maybe it's easy for me to get a, a teaching job as well. So I applied for training as a teacher, but I don't know why. And I was allocated to do the TCM studies. So that's the way. And now I'm quite happy to say I'm very happy for is this kind of the and who did that? I maybe I don't know who made me, you know, appointed me to, to this medical. In fact, my father, although he was a teacher, but he also enjoyed in practicing Chinese medicine, especially acupuncture. Of course, he has no training, but but just by reading the textbook, a Chinese textbook, so he can practice on his friends, family members, and the local communities. Of course, without charging, you know, just for fun, for treating for free. And he was quite popular, you know, like if someone got a back pain and he could use acupuncture to fix it. And then they may send him some eggs or chicken hams for, for, for his hard work. So, in fact, yeah, this also helped me to involve with the TCM practice from that time. And um, how long have you worked in TCM for? Well, that is, well, since 1976. So I think it's nearly, almost nearly 30 years now. <laughs> yeah. And now, can I talk to you about um, your job as a TCM practitioner? How many um, practices have you worked for? And can you tell me a bit about the work that you do? Yeah. Um, Initially, I was employed by a small company to work as a TCM practitioner. So I worked in Cambridge for about one and a half years. And it's just uh, seeing the patient. And for that kind of the practice, so I was, you know, quite enjoyed because that gave me experience and also gave me chance to practice English. And since then, I, in 1997, so Middlesex University set up this TCM course, so I applied, so I was the only uh, staff which, you know, to appointed as a senior lecturer, so in 1997, so I just worked as a TCM uh, tutor or senior lecturer in this program, so that's my way. Apart from working at Cambridge, because my work moved from Cambridge to, to Middlesex, so at that time the, the, that was in the North Middlesex Hospital in uh, uh, Edmonton, so I decided to move back to the Hertfordshire. So then I set up a practice at Watson Cross, which is not far to uh, Edmonton. So my practice in um, Watson Cross is my own practice. And in the meantime, I also joined another practice in Chinford, Chinford Medical Center, which is a GP practice. So I hired their room for practice Chinese medicine. So that was the way. And then I kept working in the Watson Cross, my own practice as a, as a part-time till 2007. And then I moved back to Cambridge. So now I have practice in Cambridge and uh, my own practice. And also I used to work another, the osteopath clinic in Cambridge as well. So there are quite a few different the practice. Yeah. And um, what kind of conditions do people come to you to get treatment for? Well, depends on what kind of treatment I'm supplying. Normally, I use acupuncture treatment for pain-related conditions. For example, you know, headache, sciatica, frozen shoulders, or stiff neck. That is for acupuncture practice. For herbal medicine, we treat more serious or more internal condition, which we call uh, like infertilities and gastric uh, problems, like uh, ulcerative colitis, which is I. I'm quite interesting, and some other, you know, like depressions, and yeah, these kind of the conditions. Mm. And then, what are the reasons that they give for choosing TCM? Well, 
and to me, our, all our patients who are choosing TCM is almost their last options. As you know, NHS GPs free of charge, so to see TCM practice or acupuncture, they have to pay quite a lot, you know. So it's almost they have tried everything and they're fed up and then they find something different. So for acupuncture, it's like you know, either if you got a headache, you may take the painkillers or, you know, like this kind of condition, anti-inflammatory, which for frozen shoulder, for example, and they're fed up, they find it's not helping. So therefore, they want to speed up their healing process. They want to find trying something different, so they, they come to us. And for herbal medicines, you know, like uh, infertilities, which is mainly they find it is helping them, and most of, you know, stories there or publicities, so therefore they would like to see the Chinese medicine. Of course, this is also their self-founded practice. So to us, uh, we have to have something like in you know, a result. You have to make them feeling better or to, 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 to reduce their previous you know, complaints. Otherwise, they will not come to us. You know. And are these treatments ever referred from um, the NHS treatments? No. Very, very seldom. Um, it's most likely all, all our patients are by word of mouth. So um, we very occasionally get the referral from NHS or GPs. I think partly, partially it's due to their ethic issues. For example, if a GP refer a patient to see some, somebody or some other professions, they have to take responsibilities by themselves. Why currently traditional Chinese medicine or acupuncture is not regulated, statutory regulated practice. So therefore they don't know the quality of each practitioners. So instead of refer, sometimes the GP they may give them a kind of you know the the say, okay, if patients say can I see acupuncturist, GP would say, okay, it's all right, you know, you can see, but it's not my referral. So that's the issue. So we just hope one day this practice can be statutory regulated and then we can get more referral from NHS or GPs. And um, how do you think TCM could fit into the NHS system? Well, I think there are a lot of you know, beneficial points for TCM, for acupuncture, which can help to reduce the cost, for example. You know, reason that uh, patients would pay themselves to see other practice, it is because it is helpful. At least the patient think it is helpful. But on the other hand, you know, like acupuncture, you certainly should have some almost instant effect. If you got a headache, if you got a migraine, if you got the sciaticos, by visiting acupuncturists and then after a few sessions, they can get in better, they can back to normal. To do their normal job, why not? You know, try this. So I think for acupuncture, for example, Chinese medicine, the practice, if it is fit into the uh, NHS service, and at least we can help to change our patients' well-beings and their health, and also could reduce the cost, which is you know, Chinese medicine or acupuncture is much cheaper than long-term taking the drugs or to be in the ear health which affect their normal job. So definitely, if it's, this practice is being um, properly regulated and with good standard, so we will be able to help in reduce the cost from NHS. Plus, as you know, in China, that kind of the practice, Chinese medicine, it is covered by so-called NHS. And so Chinese patients in China, they know which one, which practice Western medicine or Chinese medicine is better for their own conditions. So in China, it is a kind of this, you know, referral to each other's. If it's acute need operation, so they definitely they will go to the Western medicine. If it's chronic, for example, like a stroke, if patient have a stroke and then they paralyze, they won't be able to work. Here is more like just okay, do your own rehab. But actually, acupuncture trainer or Chinese herbal medicine may speed speed up their healing, and you know that's the way we think it can can help 
can benefit our patients in UK. And um, I know you've mentioned regulation and fitting in with the NHS, but are there any other issues facing TCM that are discussed in the medical community? Yeah, it's the standard. Because currently, lack of the regulation or the, the legal recognitions, so therefore, it is like everybody can practice acupuncture or herbal medicine without proper uh, assessing or monitoring. And uh, you possibly know, you know, during the past 10 or 20 years, in the UK, there were so many shops set up in London or in the UK for TCM shops. So these kind of the shops, you know, it's so easy. It's much easier than setting up a restaurant. But bear in your mind, this is to see the patient. So you could make a patient ill, you could kill the patient. Why the local government or the, 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 the government did not set up a standard to check their qualifications? So this kind of the shop, possibly they may more interested or focus on profit. So rather than make people feeling well or you know, treating their conditions. So this is the frustration. And uh, fortunately, now that has been almost the past. So because the cost is too high, and so many shops were closed. And now they just left the business. Good practitioners keep practicing. And um, do you have any interesting stories of any, of any patient or staff relations in the in the practices you've worked in? Well, a lot. <laughs> I don't know. You know what is the the what do you mean the interesting case? As like myself, I treating something like thirty to forty patients per week. So we do have a good uh, interesting case. For example, no, currently I'm treating a professor from Cambridge University and uh, he was suffering from like trigeminal uh, neuralgia which he was under a lot of you know very severe strong painkillers but I still didn't control his symptoms so he had, he had been on the medication for over six months and then I don't know what the reason brought her brought him to see me. So after a few sessions of acupuncture, he can see the pain has dramatically reduced. But of course, initially, was he still with his proper medications. And now gradually, he is reducing his strong painkillers and almost you know, back to normal. So this is, he said, OK, this is the interesting case. But to me, it's quite you know, simple. It is we have this kind of the effect almost on a daily basis. Otherwise, we won't have a new patients. Yeah. And um, I'd like to talk about your job as a senior lecturer here. Um, could you tell me what is your main area of expertise and what course you teach? All right. Um, yeah, as I just previously mentioned, I was the first, the staff, when we set up this TCM degree course in 1997. But I only work part-time, 0.5, full-time equivalent, which means I only work two and a half days a week. So the other part-time, I'm practice. So I always try to balance my own personal life. You know, one is yin, another is yang, so which is well balanced. So for my uh, senior lecture since 1997, initially I was helping the other staff to set up this degree course. So as, as I said, you know, I was the first one. At that time, we have no student yet. So we just did, I just did some the preparation. And then in 1997, June, uh, September, so we have the first cohort student. So I was just managing the program for a few years as a program leader. But I found it's quite hard to, you know, to, to manage a program as a, on the part-time base so then I just leave this, I left this, the post to the others, just to keep doing my teaching. So currently I'm just teaching a few modules in this course. As for administrations, so my colleagues will do the work for me. <laughs>
Could you give us a few examples of what modules you teach? Um, I am teaching like foundations of Chinese medicine and Chinese medicine diagnostic skills. I also teach the, the classic, which we call classic text, which is mainly, you know, discussed with very old traditional Chinese medicine and classic texts. And I also running some uh, few, I also teach advanced classic text on postgraduate the course in here. And plus, uh, two years ago, we also set up a new module for Tuina, so I'm also doing Tuina massage module as well. And is that a practical element as well? Yeah, the, the three nights mainly practice and the theories as well. And um, what hours do you work here? Well, here just two and a half days. And if it's the turn time, like from September to the May or June, we most likely to work from nine to five or nine to six. If it's no school, no, no students, so we work more flexible times. And um, what qualifications are students required in order to take this course? It's just a normal university qualification requirement. Um, basically, we would ask them to have, uh, you know, like A level, uh, GCSE, you know, mainly in the science subject, like. Uh, biology or chemistry, you know, like uh, at least they have a B, A or B above. So we, that's all requirement. And um, what are the TCE treatments that students are popular with? You mean here for teaching? Yeah. Yeah, we, up to June this year, and we have a teaching clinic in Archway, which is called Ascent Academy. So that's our teaching training centers affiliated to the Middlesex University. Um, so they will provide patients training for our clinic teachers. So from last month, actually, we set up our own practice at the clinic, which is called the Park Clinic, not far away from here. It's more close to the calling there. So we have our own the you know university teaching clinic, teaching practice clinic for TCM patients and also for Western medicine uh, students as well. And then within TCM, which practices are most common for students to learn? Well, we now we have two degrees, undergraduate degrees. One is for acupuncture. One is for TCM, which means both acupuncture herb medicine. So we have to apply the acupuncture practice and the Chinese herb medicine and the Tuina massage. All these should be covered by this teaching clinic. And what do your students do um, after graduation? Um, from past feedback from past uh, graduates, most of them are practicing themselves, you know, set him up, set up their own practice. And some of them are quite successful, but not all of them. Some of them they may just change to move to the other subject or areas. We also have graduates who work at NHS as some NHS hospitals, for example, which I, I understand, and they have an acupuncture treatment for their patients, like pain clinic. And they may just apply, and they may just, just uh, employ one or two part-time practitioners. So some of their practitioners, which I understand is one of uh, it's our graduates, so they practice in the NHS. But of course, it's a NHS practice, so they just get fixed paid, not uh, as a private practice. Yeah. So quite high percentage, they run up their, their own practice. Um, I would say possibly 60 to 70s mm. and then you may also have like 10 or 20 percent just to change their career move to the other subject or even some of them may after graduation they start to learn western medicines and some may just travel you know just didn't practice at all 
And could you tell me about the background of these students? Well, most of our students are initially was more like mature student, which means they were already in practice or in other fields for many years. And then they may just find out, oh, I need to do something seriously. So they want to get some professional the, the program and then they come to us. Or some students, they have already are interested in Chinese culture, for example, for example, martial art, Tai Chi, and then they want to develop further and then they come to study the TCM or acupuncture. And another f- proportion of our students which is like A-level, in a school which we call the school leavers. So they may also have this kind of the knowledge and the by work experience and you know like each if they visit some TCM practice or GPs and they want to do medicine but they find the Western medicine is too hard or to it's not to their the taste so they will try some different the, the practice and sometimes it's also due to their family members like parents give them advice and then they say okay yeah this is good and I just use natural remedies, herbs, instead of use the chemicals, or I just use like, uh, you know, needles, rather than taking the medicines, and they come to us. Um, what are the future prospects of the course that you're teaching now? Well, that's an interesting case, as if I answer at these stages, we are, to myself, you know, we are in a kind of a difficulty stages as you know and due to the tuition fees so nine thousand pounds for this university you know for to do a degree course like acupuncture herbal medicine you know three or four years it is quite a big commitment for them so looks like uh, you know undergraduate there is and uh, some kind of the problem to recruit and, uh, but in, on, on the other hand, we also set up some different uh, postgraduate, which we're trying to match, trying to you know, keep going. And it is due to the financial issues, as people have less money and they're very, very concerned about their pocket. So we just hope if this crisis is over, we may have more students. And the most important issue to our student the recruitment is statutory regulation. So the government has already promised to regulate acupuncture Chinese medicine practice since 2000, and now it's 13 years past. So they still haven't, you know, regulated this practice. So without the statutory regulation, that means their lack of statutes. So therefore, you know, why, as a student, why should I? What do I need to spend? You know, f- like. 40, 50,000 pounds to do your degree and I can do some other schools like a part-time much cheaper. So this is the threat to us. And um, what's the significance of this BSc program as the first Chinese medicine degree in Europe? Well, we said we have the first the degree course in BSc TCM, as you can see, prior to that, the TCM or acupuncture training in the UK, in the West, in the Europe, is all private, not reached to university degree standard. So by develop this BSc TCM degree course, which initially we were cooperated with Beijing University of traditional Chinese medicine in China. So it is the a kind of, you know, you can say a benchmark or a standard which you reach to uh, university degree, the level. So we hoped that that would help the univer- or the government to set up a standard for regulations. So that is where our initial, uh, you know, the sort. But because of the lack of the, the, the statutory regulations and because of very slow reactions from the government. So 
we may see, you know, if they didn't, if they, if, they, if they don't want to regulate this practice, so in that case they may have no significance at all. So we just hope we keep running, keep lobbying the UK government to regulate this practice. And uh, just like I said, you know, in China it is a medicine. It is the same status as Western medicine. So you can't say, oh, they are using different things. They, we can't understand that they are you know, not scientific and then you just uh, don't want to regulate them. So it is, you know, we said with this degree course, it certainly will raise the standard. And what is your department or the students and the staff doing um, it, towards this challenge of having the government to regulate this? Well, not much you can do actually is there from educational the aspect what you can do you just to you know to give the government advice or opinions to lobby so we tried and like uh, uh, last May or April so you know we cooperate with professional organizations we went to demonstration on the, on the parliament in the front of the parliament to to request to the government to speed up their statutory regulations as you know that uh, government never said they were not regulated they said that they will they would regulate it, but it's just a very very slow you know um, past the three years ago I think you know when the conservative Tory in, in power so that the uh, health secretary what his name um, Andrew Lansley so he announced said that he would regulate herbal medicine including Chinese herbal medicine in 2011 so that was he announced in 2010 so now it's 2003 still have no action but he, he wasn't the health secretary anymore so you know it's due to the other person we just uh, hope they can you know to to speed up this process one day and so let's see. I think that's all for the studying um can I ask you oh, actually no there's one more thing how do you choose the content of the courses is it based on what your expertise is or this, is there a wider well we have uh, a curriculum mm -hmm. and initially you know like our four years BSc degree BSc TCM courses uh, actually our curriculum is almost you know copied or identical or they use the Beijing universities the co-curriculum so we set up you know, most of the subjects based on Beijing University because at that time, our degree course, you know, the student need to practice in Beijing, China for five months. So after graduation, they will get a degree from Beijing University of TCM as well. So therefore, the, the contents, you know, the, the subject the curriculum has to be agreed by both universities. So our standard from TCM, you know, as, uh, aspect, I think it's quite high reach to the highest standard, as far as I understand. I'd like to ask you about your role as president of the ATCM. Um, could you tell me about what you did in that role? Uh, well, um, I think I'm not quite sure. It's possible it was 2002 or 2004. Yeah, the reason I worked as a president of Traditional Chinese Medicine Association, ATCM, it was at that time, as you know, they, we were discussed that uh, there, were, that there would be a statutory regulation for TCM, for Traditional Chinese Medicine and Acupuncture. So we need to raise the standard for professional uh, organizations. So at that time, I would say the you know the ATCM, although ATCM was formed in 1994, initially just very only 
something like 30 or 40 members. So by the time I try to work there, so it must something around 150 members. So we need attract more people or practitioners to join our association so, and also raise the standard as a professions. So that was my initial thought. I said, okay, I can use my knowledge and, uh, you know, for example, communication with the government at that time was a labor government. And so we, I just stand up as a president. And how was your experience as president of the association? Well, it's a hard work, actually. It is very hard as not just uh, long hours hard work, but you have to be able to unite, you know, the other parties or other professional the organizations, not unite them. Sometimes you have to fight. As you know, the, the Chinese communities, we always have this kind of the habit or culture, you know, everybody want to be the head. So therefore, more and more um, organization form because they have different view, different opinions. So when I was uh, elected as president, so I just tried to unite. So for example, we merged with another two organization which, you know, make TCM, ATCM much strong, bigger. So by the time when I left ATCM, we have already have like over 700 members. So that member figure has still kept up to today. So I have to work with TCM communities and Chinese communities, plus work with, you know, to have communication, dialogue, discussion with the government. Yeah. It is very, very hard work, as, as far as I can see. And which are the two associations that you merged together? And one is called uh, Zhongshan Acupuncture Association, which was led by Dr. Lili Chang. I think she must have retired now. And another is called the, by association led by Dr. Ke, Song Xuan Ke. They called Association of Chinese Medicine. Yeah, so we just merged together in 2005, I think. And then you said you left in 2006. Yeah. What were your reasons for leaving? Well, it's. Um, I think I have worked as a president for four years and. Normally, we have this kind of, you know, undocumented, and, uh, yeah, not on our curriculum or the, the constitution. It's more like you just work for two terms. So by the time you reach two terms, you, I need to step down. Apart from that, and also I think it is the time for me to rest and I need to look after my own family. I think that is also another major issue. So to give chance to the others and also look after my family, because when you are doing, you know, doing this the the job for president for ATCM, it's almost a full time job. Plus, I have my own full time practice and uh, teaching. So it's just used all my spare times. So I need rest. So I just uh, left ATCM, but I'm not, I'm not I'm not left left ATCM completely. So I just uh, still be two years as a council members. And then after two years, I just left completely. And I um, also find another most, in, you know, one of the interesting area, which is for I'm managing the TCMs. Another subject, uh, another the part of a TCM is accreditation board. So I'm working there. And um, what do you think of the work that ATCM does now? Sorry, say it again. What do you think of the work that ATCM does now? Oh yes, I think the the ATCM as a professional organization is more matured. So now it's more like just day to day running, and you know we have a office, we have a staff. So it's more like day to day running and to monitor situations. But uh, when I was president, you know it's different. It's very hard. We have no staff, no the office, 
as possible you may know actually we used to use mean as the office and use mean as the human resources to manage our telephone calls and uh, you know we have a very good relationship with mean I at that time so now it's more matured I think the you know for the last few years we have already had another two president so it's more like just running the practice running the organization and then since then have you worked with any other associations no I only and as a member of ATCM, well, apart from association like in the, in the, the teaching in the universities, not any other organization. Um, I'd like to ask you in general more about the TCM issues and the challenges that TCM practitioners face now. What are the views among Western practitioners or teachers and students that you've encountered regarding TCM? And your question to again? Um, what are the views among Western practitioners and students or teachers about TCM? Okay, yeah, and I think because traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, it's originated from China and it is a traditional practice and developed through associated with Chinese culture. Therefore, the terminology is a big issue to me. You know, like nowadays, Western medicine, they, are not, they were not developed on a certain specific or based on one country's culture. So it is the terminology. Chinese medicine has been practiced over 2,000 years. They have their own language. But this language may not be able to interpret or translate it into proper English or Western medical concept, for example, channels or qi, you know, this kind of the terminology for Chinese, it's very easy to understand, you know, if you said the qi, we use the qi very often, but if you translate the qi as energy, and Western medical, they will find, oh, what is energy, you know, it's kind of the, the way they couldn't understand. So therefore, if they don't understand, they will say, oh, you're just talking rubbish, you're talking aliens. So completely different languages. But if we try to work with them, you know, to explain or using to translate in a different way, so possibly these two practices can match, although they won't be able to match using the same you know, treatment scope, but terminology can be explained from Western medicine. For example, you know, like uh, Chinese medicine, when I teach here, we have a Jin essence, we translate it as essence. So this essence, we said, it's kidney, kidney in charge of essence. So from Western medicine, what do you mean in essence? We don't, you know, Western medicine, they don't know what is the essence. In, because in Europe, in, in, in Western medical term, there's no essence as uh, such. But if I said, well, this TCM essence, Chinese medicine, can be divided into two parts. One is prenatal, which means before we were born, we have got this essence, and that was given by our parents, which means, you know, when a sperm and the egg meet, met, and then you have this essence. So this, I said, actually, this essence, prenatal essence, is more like DNA, you know, from our parents. And we also have another essence which is called the postnatal essence. That was we obtained, we gained after our bone. So both were stored in the kidney. So this postnatal essence is more like, you know, hormones. If you in like you know to match with this animal, so, oh yes, that makes sense. We have prenatal essence, we have postnatal essence. So prenatal is more like you know, inherited from parents. It's more like what you look like, DNA, genes, this kind of issue. And the post is more like, you know, developed, like when you reach to 14 years old, 13, 14, you have periods, menstruation. That is also essence. So it's more like hormones. If you said, okay, these are all stored in the kidney, 
but it's not exactly the kidney. We just use the kidney as an example. You know, like even Western medicine, you have adrenaline, which is on top of the kidney, above the kidney. But TCM kidney may much bigger or larger. So if you see that, you know, in fact, they use different terminology to explain the same thing: human body. So it could make sense. I think this is the way we, I would, you know, I would also would like to work in the future, just to make, to let the Chinese medicine terminology to be understandable by Westerners or Western practitioners or Western peoples. Do you have any Western students, or do they and do they struggle with the terminology? Yes. Well, as you know, most our most of our students were foreigners. It's not Chinese, so we have to give them this kind of the training from the day one. So as we said, you are learning a completely different medical system. So I always emphasize. In fact, it is just about the terminology. Both Western medicine and Chinese medicine, our common destination, or the we. It's our patient. It's patient. The patient is a human being. Depends on what way, what method you are treating them. So Chinese developed a completely different systems or terminology to understand to treat, and Western medicine as well. So it's in a way, you know, it's just the way we need to work together to to compromise. Yeah, to to not compromise, to cooperate. You know, coordinate with both practice. Um, and so, what are the challenges facing TCM practitioners and in education today? The challenge is, well, I think it's you know, mainly if you talk about the universities, it's the funding um, student. If you raise up like tuition fees too high, which you would exclude. You know those who were thinking about doing this, but if it's too expensive, they may not be able to to join this course. I think this is the big issue to us. We just、uh, you know want to make if you want to raise up a standard, but、uh, on other hand, you lack of investment and the resources, so then you can't achieve. So it's most like you know because of The resources there, limited resources, so you can't try to do better. You just maintain the current situations or standard. And、um, has the role of TCM changed over the past few years? Do you think? Well, not very much. To me, the during the past. Or if you talk about the over a hundred years ago, you know the TCM training is more like based on apprenticeship, which you know one practitioner or experienced practitioner they may have few the students which just work for these old traditional medical practitioners for free for like ten years and then after ten years during this practice apprenticeship so. They gain knowledge. They gain the practice. So after a certain time, they say, "Okay, it's time you can set up your own practice." So that was past the training. But now, I think for the last sixty years, because China also have this university degree course and the university trainings, so it's more like you know college, the training. So that is the good because you can set up the same standard. If it's individual trained, so it's hard. To set up standard, you can't say okay, you you haven't reached these standards, you can't graduate. Nobody can can do that. But today, yes, we can. And what are the effects of、um, changing modern technology had on TCM? Well, modern technology, um, no, again, not much, because Chinese medicine is developed a thousand years ago, so we don't need the modern technology. Uh, you know, like you taking the pulse, you check the tongue, so you don't need a lot of the technology. You know, even without electricity, for example, if there's the power cut without electricity, Western medicine we find it's very hard to do because 
they need to do X-ray, they need to ECG, the, the they can't. But the TCM, they still can practice. If you say any change, I would say possibly, gradually, we are more aware of safety issues. For example, herbal medicine. So we know actually, you know, you can check if you use certain amount of the herbs or to certain dosage, you may cause some side effects or toxicities. That is more in the noticeable by the current practice. So safety, I think, it has been changed. And during the past, you know, if you treat the patient even with the, with the side effect, so patient may not realize that was due to the medicine or Chinese herbs made them ill. But today we can, you know, we know like uh, uh, a few years ago we have like arostenocure acid, um, this kind of fangji ma ling, which caused the kidney damage. So people are, or Chinese practitioners are more aware, safety, you know, you certain toxic herbs you shouldn't be, you shouldn't use for for a certain time or you have to be aware to check their, uh, like to do their blood test or liver function or kidney test. So that's, you can say it is a development of modern technology we can use. And um, let's talk about more about your personal career. What would you say is the best thing about your job? Well, as I said, you know, I just enjoy my current situations. As I said, if I say teaching is yin and my practice is yang, so we always teach, you know, like I'm teaching foundations, we need to balance yin and yang is good balance. So my current situation is, you know, I'm teaching two and a half days. Also, I teach other institute, you know, for, uh, for weekend. But I also practice day-to-day -day practice. So if you ask me to practice in like five days a week, possibly I would find that it's too boring. On the other hand, if you ask me to do full-time teaching, I also find the boring. Because without clinic experience, and if you only teaching from, we said, from book to book, from notebook to notebook, actually you run out of the resources. So you, because Chinese medicine is more clinic-based experience, the practice, so you have to have these kind of, you know, uh, examples, cases, and to let to integrate the with your theories. I think that just gave me a kind of way. You know, I always using like examples because this example I don't need to prepare because it's it was happened yesterday. For example, I'm teaching today, so suddenly, I say, oh yeah, this is example actually. You know, it's a case I used yesterday, so I can give the patient, uh, give our student this kind of the, the, the case to explain. And on the other hand, teaching make me, academic teachings, and make me to study more, to do more research or readings. So that will help to my practice as well. If patient asking why, you know, why you use this, and I said, well, that's very easy because I always see talking about this in, 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 my, in the class, so to the student. So it is interrelated, which is beneficial both for practice and the teaching. Mm. And what would you say the worst thing about your job is? The worst job of our my the, uh, the, the currently is sometimes it's too busy, you know, it's just... Uh, well, like last few weeks, you know, I'm traveling three days to Cambridge, from Cambridge to this, you know, and uh, teaching three days. Like Friday, I teach from 12 to 2 for postgraduate. And then from half past 2 to 5, another postgraduate, he only have five hours, another half an hour for lunch, for break. Yeah, that makes me feel quite exhausting and then talk about the practice yeah practice is sometimes you just you you treat some conditions you know you can't make them better or can cannot you know like to get uh, what you wanted the result yeah that's quite frustrating 
And have there any, been any significant turning points in your career in TCM? Or have there been any significant people or events that have influenced you? Yes. Um, well, while I was doing my master's degrees in Shanghai University of TCM in 1985 or 86, you know, my supervisor which Professor Li Ding and he gave me a good examples. He's a scholar in you know, a very knowledgeable, experienced, very good uh, in Chinese medicine acupuncture theories. Quite a few textbooks which edited or you know um, published by himself. So while I was there, you know, I certainly noticed his the way of studies in the academic styles, which gave me a very good, well, a very active influence. Which, if you want to do something, you have to be clearly, you know, I, which we said, have to do it thoroughly. Don't publish your findings without any second opinion or without thinking, because you may find something, or you know, what you said is wrong after a few years. So that was the first professor when I was in China. And the second professor was when I worked in Nanjing University as a senior lecturer. Um, my colleague, another professor, Professor Yang. So we used to share one office. Um, he was the, the director of the Department of Acupuncture at that time. But uh, he left the post and then he just uh, teaching. But he was a very good experienced the TCM practitioner. So we both, you know, work in a teaching clinic certain days in a week. So we just sit in, in front of you know, each other. And he was very experienced, knowledgeable TCM practitioners. So he gave me quite a lot of, you know, ideas of thinking, which how to understand traditional Chinese medicine theories. I think these two uh, professor with, uh, professors, which gave me quite a good influence, in TCM, one is for academic, another is in clinical practice. And um, where does your attitude and ethics to work come from? To work? Where does your attitude and ethics towards your work come from? Uh, well, <laughs> that could be back to the, yeah, well, our culture, in fact. Um, I can see, you know, we all I always been taught or instructed to work harder, to look after the people. Don't, you know, like uh, like that professor Yang in China said, you never ever thinking about to make money from your patients. He said, why? Because nobody would like to spend money on, you know, see a, uh, see a doctor. So they were not happy to, to spend money to see a, a doctor because this is the, we call the tear money, tears money. So this, and that gave me quite good, you know, if you only try to help them. By helping them, they were happy to pay you. So it is this kind of award, you know, reward for your practice. So this is the way I think, you know, we just always patient, their conditions first. This is our priority. By providing this kind of service, you get award. Yeah. And also another good turning point, which you could also say the turning point was my grandmother. Well, of course, he died many years ago. You know, when I was young, he gave me quite good, you know, the the, the inspirations, although. She was very old, like you know, like a small food, which they they they, they what do you call that? The food in, in ancient China, they they have to be very tiny, small. He was she was in that kind of the stages, but she had her own views to the life, to the how to you know how to work, how to how to how to study, how to look after your your family. I remembered, um. After practiced in the clinic in China for four years, and after graduation of the, uh, you know, from the medical schools, and then I, 
I got a, a post to the to the master degrees in in Shanghai University. So once I got that uh, letter, said, "Well, you can join us from when and when," and there was about three months gap. So my employer at that time, you know, uh, the local hospital said, "Well, you can leave now. You can take these three three months. We will still pay you, but you can leave." But my grandma said, "No, you shouldn't." She said, "You have to have have a good name, you know. Although you left, you should have a good name for that、uh, employer, which he you she used in this kind of you know, like a birds when they fly the birds on the sky, they left some sound. When the person, if you left some place, you should give them good name. They should always remember you, which that make me you know." And many many times when I want to do something, I said, "Yeah, you have to be responsible, you know, to be to do your job properly." So that was my, you could say, it's an ethical.、Mm. Mm. And、um, you mentioned you like to balance your life around work and、um, recreation. What do you do during in your private time? Well, my private time, um, well, I think it's more like if I have time. I would. Oh well, currently I'm trying to to look after my family, my children, my kids. I have two kids, so you know more time spend more time with them. But to me, actually, I also very like to do some labor work, like DIY. For example, I have a allotment in 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 my home, so we grow a lot of vegetables. If I have like half day free, I would go there to dig. To you know, make myself sweat, and that was the way I just completely forgot、yeah. any other things. Just doing this hard labor work, and it's more like similar you doing like meditations. But this is a kind of awarded meditation. Yeah, I do DIY labor work. Mm, that's great.、Um, so you said you have two children. Do、yeah. you have any aspirations of what they might do in the future? Well, they are too young, and I hope I would hope my daughter would go to you know the medical or professional careers because she is a kind of a, a girl which is very caring, very clever. But we gave her a lot of tasks, you know, like she is doing dancing, singing, swimming, and、uh, language Spanish, French, Chinese, apart from her normal. The the primary schools. Yeah, I just、uh, hope she could, you know, one day she could be in the medical professions. But for the boy, he's too young. I don't think you know I can say anything for him yet. And、um, are there any other issues that you'd like to discuss a bit more? Anything you'd like to clarify? And、um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> no. So well, thank you so much for participating in our project and sharing your stories. Thank you. Thank you.